Hey, ah, okay. Hello. Ah, oh, sorry. I was on mute. Okay, can you hear me? Ah, yes, yes. Now I can. Yes. Ah, okay. Cool. Yeah. Mm. So she, Lakshmi Priya, has not come yet, right? Or? Yeah, not come yet. She just sent me her slides. Ah, okay. I'll just do it. Yeah, can you, uh, if in case she comes, can you admit her? I'm just trying to. Yes, yes. Yeah, I will, I will, I will. <coughs> Okay. Some. Yogesh, you already started recording for some reason. Oh yeah. Yogesh. Okay. So welcome everyone to the probability seminar. So we have two talks. Uh, so the first speaker is uh, Lakshmi Priya from IAC. And uh, she will be talking about uh, overcrowding estimates for nodal volume of uh, centered stationary Gaussian processes. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful opportunity. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, overcrowding estimates for uh, nodal volume of uh, centered stationary Gaussian processes. So uh, this is the plan of my talk. Uh, in the first part of my talk, I would like to introduce the problem and uh, maybe provide some heuristics. Uh, so there won't be any uh, rigorous discussion in this part of the talk. In the uh, second and third parts of the talk, uh, I would like to show how to get uh, overcrowding estimates in uh, dimension one and uh, in higher dimensions. So uh, let me start with a few definitions. Uh, a centered uh, so in, uh, throughout this talk, I'll be uh, interested in uh, studying about uh, centered stationary Gaussian processes. So what is it? It is a Gaussian process, which is uh, invariant under translations. To every such uh, stationary Gaussian process, we can associate uh, something called its spectral measure. And uh, it, is the, it is the unique finite uh, uh, symmetric Borel measure on RD, uh, which is uh, related to the process via its uh, covariance kernel. So the covariance kernel of the process is just uh, the Fourier transform of the measure mu. So uh, we will be interested in studying some aspect of the uh, nodal set of X. And uh, here is a useful point to keep in mind. Uh, so if we look at the nodal set of a stationary Gaussian process, almost surely it is not going to have any singular zeros. So uh, what is a singular zero? Uh, it is a point where uh, both the function and its gradient vanish. So if there are no singular zeros for f, its uh, zero set is going to be very nice. Uh, more precisely, implicit function theorem implies that, uh, say in dimension two, 
the zero set is going to be a collection of uh, smooth curves. Uh, so these curves are either going to be closed curves or uh, by infinite paths. Okay, so uh, these are the two aspects of the nodal set we'll be interested in. Uh, the first one is the zero count. So uh, for processes on R, we look at the interval zero to T and uh, we let MT be the uh, number of zeros of the process in this interval. And uh, for uh, processes defined on R2, we look at this box of uh, side length T and uh, consider the uh, zero set here and we let uh, LT be the length of the uh, nodal set in this box. When uh, m is a positive integer, we can write uh, the total nodal count in this uh, entire box nm as uh, a sum of the nodal counts in the subintervals. So we can uh, write it this way, where uh, each of these random variables are going to be identically distributed because of stationarity. So uh, if we take the expectation here, we get uh, expectation of nm is going to be proportional to m, where uh, the proportionality constant is just the expected uh, zero count on a unit interval. So a similar, using a similar argument, uh, we can argue that uh, uh, the, uh, zero, the expected zero count on any interval is going to be proportional to its uh, length and uh, similarly, the expected nodal length in any uh, uh, domain is going to be proportional to its area. And uh, hence, we get uh, these two. Uh, one question, Lakshmi Priya. Yeah. There's a question in chat. Uh, Vivi mm -hmm. is asking, and you didn't say anything about the process. Are okay. these even finite, the numbers? Sorry? Are the number of zeros even finite? Okay, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll come to that uh, in a few slides from now. It can be, it can be infinite also. So it depends on the uh, uh, second moment of uh, the spectral measure, but uh, I'll come to that very soon. But uh, maybe you did not say anything of that kind of processes you're looking at, smooth ones, right? Maybe. Yes, yes. Yes, I am looking at uh, smooth stationary ocean process. Uh, yeah, I'll come to that uh, in, uh, in the next slide maybe. So, uh, yeah, so the question we are interested in is, yeah, I have not yet uh, stated the precise question. I'll come to that in the next slide or uh, in uh, two slides from now. So uh, we are interested in uh, this overcrowding event, which is the uh, event that uh, the uh, nodal count in, uh, in an interval is much larger than uh, its expected value and uh, an analogous question for the uh, nodal length as well. Okay, uh, so we next want to understand uh, uh, the role played by uh, spectral measure in the zero count. Uh, more specifically, which aspects or uh, features of the uh, spectral measure influence the zero count and in what ways? So uh, for this, let's take a simple example. Uh, we take this uh, uh, spectral measure mu so uh, this is supported at uh, precisely uh, these six points, plus minus two, plus minus seven, and plus minus 30. So for this spectral measure, we can uh, explicitly write, uh, write down the process X and uh, X has this form. So uh, X is uh, just uh, a random linear combination of uh, sine and cosine waves whose uh, frequency come from the support of the measure. And uh, these coefficients in front of these uh, sine and cosine waves are going to be uh, independent uh, centered Gaussians. And uh, the, uh, the variance of, uh, the, uh, of uh, for example, this coefficient corresponds to the uh, measure assigned by mu to the corresponding frequency. So here, xi a is going to be uh, a normal zero a random variable. So if we take uh, a to be a really small uh, number, a really small positive number, then um, 
uh, this xi a is going to be very small with a high probability and so is eta a so this term contributes very less to the entire sum okay so uh, we want to ask about uh, the zero count of uh, this process so obviously uh, it depends on the values of uh, a b and c so we consider two cases let's take uh, the first case the first is when uh, c is much larger than uh, a and b and uh, assume that a and b are negligible in which case these two terms are going to be very small so x can essentially be thought of as a random wave with frequency 30 so uh, similarly um, if we consider the uh, other case where uh, a is much larger than b and c uh, then uh, these two terms here are going to be very small and hence x can essentially be thought of as a random wave with frequency 2. So what do these mean about the zero count of the process? Uh, if we fix an interval and ask for the number of zeros in this case, it is going to be a constant times 30. And uh, if we ask for the number of zeros in this case, it is going to be a constant times 2. So uh, the conclusion we make, uh, at least in this specific example, is that uh, if the tail of mu is heavy, then there are more oscillations and hence possibly many more zeros. Okay, so uh, the next question uh, uh, we want to ask is, uh, can we make a similar heuristic conclusion for more general spectral measures as well? Okay, so if uh, mu is uh, any other general uh, spectral measure, uh, in this case too, we can think of the uh, corresponding process X as a, a random superposition of waves whose uh, frequencies come from the support of uh, mu. So this is uh, made somewhat precise by uh, the statement here. Uh, so what we have here is uh, for any uh, spectral measure mu, uh, the topological support of X is going to be uh, this space. It is the Fourier transform of uh, L2 symmetric mu. So what is the space L2 symmetric mu? So uh, these are complex valued functions uh, which are in L2 mu and which satisfy this symmetry condition. So uh, this symmet symmetry condition ensures that uh, the Fourier transform of uh, functions from here are actually real valued. Okay, so uh, let's next take a somewhat uh, non-trivial example and uh, try to uh, analyze the question for this example. So uh, we take mu to be a uniform measure on uh, minus 14 to 14. So uh, the naive expectation from uh, such a measure is that if we take a function f uh, from the space uh, a Fourier transform of L2 symmetric mu, um, I mean, this is a naive expectation. Uh, we, we might expect that uh, since it is composed of uh, frequencies uh, which uh, vary from 0 to 14, uh, this function f is not going to oscillate uh, more than sine 14 t, which is the wave with frequency 14. But uh, this is very far from reality. In fact, uh, the uh, Fourier trans, so this space, uh, that is the support of X, topological support of X, is going to be all continuous functions on R. Nevertheless, this naive expectation is probabilistically okay. So uh, why so? So it is the higher derivatives of a function which uh, contribute to the uh, oscillations of the function. So if we can argue that uh, with a high probability, the uh, higher derivatives of x are going to be similar to the higher derivatives of uh, sine 14t, uh, then uh, this statement is uh, somewhat justified. So how do we do that? 
Uh, there are some uh, standard results, namely the Borel TIS inequality and uh, Dudley bounds, which uh, give tail bounds uh, for any Gaussian process. And uh, uh, we use that uh, to conclude that the tail of uh, Xn, which is also going to be a centered stationary Gaussian process, is going to be much lighter than the tail of uh, this normal random variable whose uh, mean is 14 to the n and standard deviation is also 14 to the n. Hence, uh, from here we can conclude that with a very high probability, if we are looking at the uh, supnorm of uh, xn in a fixed so One second, Lakshmi Priya, is yeah. x, xn is the nth derivative or what? Yes, yes, yeah, okay, right. okay, okay. xn is the, just the nth derivative. Okay, thanks. So uh, with a very so from here we can conclude that uh, with a very high probability uh, x the supnorm of x n in an interval uh, here let's just take it to be zero one is going to be smaller than n times fourteen to the n and uh, we compare this with uh, the sine wave its uh, nth derivative is uh, just going to be exactly fourteen to the n so we see that. Uh, uh, their higher derivatives behave in a similar way. So we expect their oscillations also to be similar. All right. So uh, this, uh, this argument is uh, not specific uh, to this example. Uh, we can similarly conclude that um, uh, for, for any um, stationary Gaussian process, it's uh, nth derivative the tail of its nth derivative is going to be much lighter than the tail of this Gaussian, where uh, Cn is the nth moment of the measure mu. So uh, the uh, higher order moments of mu control uh, the uh, higher derivatives of x. Okay, so in this case also, we can make this uh, heuristic conclusion that if uh, the tails of mu are uh, heavier, uh, then there is possibly more oscillation and hence possibly more zeros. So, uh, uh, so the conclusion is that uh, these moments Cn play a very important role uh, when we are talking about the zero count. And uh, we will see this coming up uh, almost everywhere uh, when we talk about uh, the zero count. Okay. So uh, I next want to move on to uh, talk about uh, some of the known results about uh, uh, NT. So uh, the results which are known can be uh, very broadly classified into two categories, uh, this and this. So in the first set of results, uh, which I, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, classification is made based on the assumptions on the uh, spectral measure or the um, uh, covariance kernel. So in the first set of results, they assume some um, finiteness, some conditions on the moments. Uh, more specifically, they assume that uh, moments of uh, some order up to some order are finite and uh, the kind of results they are able to conclude are uh, that the um, moments of NT are also finite. So here, I mean, to answer uh, the first question, if uh, the, uh, the expectation of NT is uh, finite if and only if the second moment of mu is uh, finite. All right. So uh, in this uh, next set of conditions, they assume uh, some moment conditions. So they assume finiteness of moments up to some order. Uh, and they also have an additional assumption on the covariance kernel uh, or the field, which is uh, the mixing condition. Um, so uh, they specify this condition in terms of uh, decay of the covariance, uh, K. Uh, so sometimes uh, it is specified in terms of uh, the exact uh, rate of decay or uh, sometimes they just want uh, K to be in uh, some LP space. Uh, so uh, this is a strong uh, assumption on the uh, covariance or the measure equivalently. 
but uh, they are also able to get uh, very strong results about uh, NT. So in the first case, they obtain a central limit theorem, and uh, in the second case, uh, this uh, is a more recent result, and uh, it's one of the uh, it's uh, the only one known of its kind. They prove uh, exponential concentration uh, for uh, the zero count NT. Okay, so uh, where do our results fit in? Uh, our results fit in somewhere in uh, between these two uh, set of results. So we assume uh, finiteness of all moments and an additional assumption, which I call uh, A1, uh, which I will say, uh, I mean, I'll say what it is precisely in the next slide. But uh, let me just say that it is not a very uh, stringent condition. So under these two assumptions, we get overcrowding estimates. So in terms of uh, the conditions on mu, our results fall somewhere in the first category. Uh, we do not assume uh, much about uh, the measure mu. Uh, but in terms of the uh, results we get, uh, surprisingly, even with these uh, somewhat weak assumptions, uh, we do manage to get some uh, strong conclusions. All right, uh, so I next want to discuss about uh, the significance of uh, these assumptions. Uh, so uh, in the second set of results, uh, the assumption about uh, mixing or decay of K was made. So the general philosophy behind this assumption is that if we look at uh, events which are uh, in well-separated intervals, uh, the decay of K implies that uh, these events are almost independent. And uh, hence, for example, if we write NT as this sum, uh, this random variable and uh, something far off here, uh, which corresponds to uh, the nodal count in a far off interval are almost independent. So uh, NT can be thought of as uh, a sum of identically distributed M dependent random variables. Uh, so the uh, CLT and the uh, exponential concentration result they get uh, with these assumptions can be thought of as uh, arising from some underlying independence. Okay. So uh, what does uh, this condition mean in terms of the spectral measure mu? Uh, suppose uh, the measure mu has a, a density uh, with respect to the Lebesgue measure, then uh, K is just the Fourier transform of that density and uh, DK of K corresponds to some uh, smoothness of uh, the density of mu. So it is a restrictive condition. Uh, we already discussed the significance of uh, finiteness of mu. Uh, this is the uh, additional condition uh, we assume on uh, uh, the spectral measure. We assume that A1 satisfies um, uh, this condition, which is that uh, um, mu has a non-trivial absolutely continuous part with respect to the spectral measure. I'll talk about the significance of this uh, in a later slide. So uh, this uh, is one uh, of our results. Lakshmi, one yes. question. Yes, sure. Uh, in the previous one, so the decomposition is into absolute continuous and singular part for the measure. Right, exactly. That's what you mean mu s. Yes, yes, yeah, right, sir. All right, so, uh, so we now, uh, so let me just uh, state uh, one of our result. Uh, this is overcrowding in one dimension. So, uh, we, uh, so for a uh, centered stationary Gaussian process on R, we assume uh, mu has uh, finite moments of all orders, uh, which will imply that uh, our uh, process X is actually smooth. And uh, we also assume that uh, mu satisfies A1. Under these two conditions, we get uh, overcrowding estimates for uh, the uh, zero count NT in terms of the moments mu, uh, sorry, in terms of the moments of mu. Okay, so uh, these are just uh, two uh, consequences of our result. Um, under, so if we assume that 
uh, mu has a compact mu has compact support and it satisfies a1 uh, then we get the exact uh, asymptotics for this probability uh, so we can take the fluctuations to be uh, of the order of uh, expectation uh, but it should be much larger than the expectation uh, in the next example uh, for suppose uh, the spectral measure mu is uh, uh, normal 0 1 random variable uh, is uh, uh, standard gaussian uh, in this case too, we get uh, the exact asymptotics uh, for this probability, but we want the fluctuations to be much larger than the expectation. And uh, uh, more specifically, we want n to be much larger than t square. In this case, we get uh, the exact asymptotics for this. All right, uh, so we come to the next part of the talk. Uh, here, I want to show you how to get uh, overcrowding estimates in dimension one. So first, so, let me sorry, Lakshmi. One yes, other question. Yeah. Uh, the two conditions you said about mixing in terms of k and moments, these are mm -hmm. somewhat unrelated. Is that correct? Yes, they are unrelated. You're you right. cannot deduce in any way one from the other, even weak, weak statements. No, not really. You're right. Thanks. Is a one a mixing kind of condition? Uh, no, A1 is not a mixing condition. I'll talk about uh, the significance of this uh, very, very soon, sir. Okay, thanks. And what can one expect if uh, f is zero? Is there any idea like how how much of a change there will be to your uh, this nodal count estimates? Uh, so you ask. Suppose it's a single. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, no, we can't uh, conclude any of these uh, estimates. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, I'll just first talk about uh, the main deterministic idea, which is used to understand uh, overcrowding. So uh, this idea has previously occurred in the works of uh, Ajay's Neulat and uh, Vishpur. And uh, the version we present here is only a slight modification of theirs and it's inspired from uh, their result. So what does this say? Uh, suppose we take a smooth enough function from on this interval 0 to 2t and uh, if we have a bound on the nth derivative of the function on this entire interval and if there is an overcrowding of zeros in the first half of the interval then necessarily the function should be very small in the other half of the interval. So the nice thing about this lemma is that it connects the zero count with uh, something about f, which are more accessible. Uh, specifically, it connects the zero count with uh, the supremum of f and uh, also that of its higher derivatives. So uh, this proof is very simple, but uh, uh, this idea is uh, very powerful. Uh, let me just uh, give you an idea of the proof now. So uh, we assume that f is as in this lemma. So uh, we assume that f has at least n zeros in zero to t. Hence, uh, f uh, hence between any two zeros of f, there should be a zero of f prime. And hence f prime has at least n minus one zeros, each of which sit between uh, two zeros of f. So uh, continuing this way, we can argue that there should be an increasing sequence of points where uh, the derivatives of the function vanish. Uh, more specifically, uh, we have this increasing sequence of points where uh, alpha k is such that fk of alpha k is zero. All right. So uh, now that we have this, it is uh, only a matter of uh, using um, a fundamental theorem of calculus to finish this proof. So uh, consider this uh, interval alpha n minus one to two t. Uh, we write this uh, by a fundamental theorem of calculus. So this is zero by our choice of alpha. And uh, we already assumed a bound for fn, which is m. So using this, we get a bound for fn minus one. So uh, we do this one more, uh, sorry, once more. Uh, we, uh, we consider t in the uh, shorter interval, alpha n minus two to 
uh, 2t it's uh, something like this we uh, now use this bound for fn minus 1 to get a bound for fn minus 2 so this involves integrating uh, this factor mt and hence we get mt square over 2 factorial so if we do this once more uh, we get mt cubed over 3 factorial and uh, hence uh, we get a bound of uh, mt to the n over n factorial for f and uh, we get this uh, result for uh, the supnorm of f on this part of the interval. Okay, so an immediate consequence of uh, this deterministic lemma is that if we have an almost surely uh, smooth random function f on the real line, and if there is an overcrowding uh, in the interval zero to t, then at least one of these two events should happen. It should have occurred. So uh, this is the event that uh, the nth derivative of f is large in supnorm. And uh, this is the event that uh, f is small in the uh, second half of the interval. So this will be the starting point for our analysis. And uh, we'll try to uh, get bounds for uh, these two quantities. Uh, so uh, this can be estimated. So if uh, f is a stationary Gaussian process, uh, this can be estimated using uh, the standard uh, Borel TS inequality and uh, Dudley's bound. And uh, we want to treat this as a small ball event. So in order to do that, m should be small enough. And uh, in order for this event to be unlikely, uh, m should be large enough. So we want to make an optimal choice of, uh, so we need to make an optimal choice of M so that uh, the sum of these two probabilities is uh, small enough. All right, uh, so in the next couple of slides, we will see how to get uh, estimates for these two events when F is a, a stationary Gaussian process. All right, uh, so this we already remarked earlier if uh, we assume that uh, the moments of mu are finite, then we get tail bounds for Xn. So if uh, X is a stationary uh, Gaussian process, uh, so are all its uh, higher derivatives. And uh, we can in fact uh, get the spectral measure of uh, Xn in terms of mu, which is going to be absolutely continuous with respect to mu, and uh, this is going to be its density. So in order to use these uh, standard results to get uh, tail bounds for uh, Xn, we only need to know uh, the uh, pseudo metric uh, which is induced by Xn on the real line R. So in this case, uh, Dn has a very simple form. Uh, and uh, this is the form. And in fact, it is comparable to the uh, standard Euclidean metric. And uh, because of this, uh, computing the uh, uh, packing numbers, covering numbers, and the associated uh, entropy, uh, getting the entropy bonds are all uh, not very difficult. I mean, are all actually very simple. And uh, going from here to uh, getting this uh, tail bonds for Xn is uh, not difficult at all. So I'm not going to talk anything more about this. But uh, I, ju I just want to remark that uh, we see that uh, the higher derivatives of uh, x uh, are controlled by the higher moments of mu. All right. So uh, I now want to talk about the significance of A1 um, and also how A1 implies a small wall estimate for uh, the stationary Gaussian process. Uh, most of the... Uh, small ball estimates that we know of is for uh, a non-smooth process. And uh, quite rightly so, because uh, it is the uh, sharp jumps of the uh, non-smooth process, which uh, make it difficult for it to be contained within a small strip. So under assumption A1, we get uh, uh, small ball estimates. So let me recall what A1 is. A1 is the assumption that uh, we, um, uh, mu has a non-trivial absolutely continuous part with respect to the spectral measure, uh, sorry, with respect to the Lebesgue measure. 
So uh, if we further assume that uh, the support of F has a non-trivial interior, I'll be able to give you a heuristic for why we can expect a small ball estimate in this case. Uh, for a more general measure mu, I do not have an explanation, but uh, let me just do this. So if uh, the support of F has a non-empty interior, then uh, the topological support of F is in fact all of CR. So uh, our process X comes very close to behaving like a non-smooth uh, process. And uh, like we remarked here, uh, for a non-smooth process, it's not very surprising that uh, there is a small ball estimate. Okay, so uh, this is just the heuristic. Uh, we, I now want to show you how to get uh, small ball estimates for uh, stationary Gaussian processes. So uh, we take this idea uh, from a paper of uh, Krishna and Manjanath. So we assume that uh, mu satisfies A1 and uh, T and M are, M is an integer, positive integer, T is a positive number and uh, T and M satisfy uh, some condition. Uh, B is a, a small constant. So under these conditions, uh, the probability that X is small on an interval is uh, bounded by this. So I just want to remark here that uh, the assumption on T and M is such that, so we are assuming that B is smaller than one. So it is such that uh, this quantity here is uh, larger than one. And uh, we will be taking M to be really large so uh, this entire thing is very large. Uh, so this estimate uh, gives us something meaningful only when eta is very small, uh, which, is what, uh, which will be the case in our situation. All right, so uh, let me now uh, give you the uh, idea of the proof. Uh, we take the process X on the real line uh, and uh, we look at this lattice. So if we restrict the process X to this lattice, uh, we can think, uh, uh, we get a, um, a stationary Gaussian process on Z. And uh, the corresponding spectral measure nu is going to be a, a, a symmetric uh, Borel measure on the circle or equivalently on this interval minus pi pi. So if we assume that uh, mu satisfies A1, uh, mu also satisfies A1. All right, uh, so we want uh, to get an estimate for this. So if X is going to be small on this interval, it is also going to be small on these uh, finitely many lattice points which are present in the interval zero to T. So that is how we get this bound. Now, this is just a Gaussian vector. So we can write, uh, the probability of this uh, in terms of uh, the covariance matrix. Uh, we now bound this, uh, okay, uh, now uh, we bound this by one and uh, that's how we get this. Uh, so now uh, we bound the determinant of uh, sigma from below by in terms of its uh, smallest eigenvalue. So lambda is the smallest eigenvalue of uh, sigma and hence we get this bound. So in order to get an upper bound for uh, this probability, it now suffices to get a good lower bound for the smallest eigenvalue of sigma, which is, which is what we will do now. So- Hold on, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Can you just go back? <coughs> Lambda depends on M. Uh, yes, you're right. Lambda- so Like as a small, uh, say, Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, lambda yes, itself yeah. is a function of M. Yes, you are right. So lambda is a function of M. Uh, you're right. Yes, so sigma is an M cross M matrix. Sigma also mm. depends on M and T. And uh, yeah, yeah. lambda also depends on M and T. You're right. Yeah. Right. So for that inequality to be helpful, you have to know what that, they, what that dependence is. Uh, yes, uh, you are right. So this is just the proof idea. So I'm not... Okay tell you how uh, we get this constant. Yeah, okay. Right, yeah. okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
so it uh, so it now just suffices to get a good enough uh, lower bound for the smallest eigen value of sigma so uh, we first note that uh, the smallest eigen value of sigma has this variational characterization so let's see what this uh, bilinear form in the numerator is uh, so this can be written in terms of uh, the spectral measure nu and uh, it turns out to be exactly the uh, l2 norm square of uh, this trigonometric polynomial where uh, v is a uh, vector in rm so uh, like i said uh, nu also uh, satisfies a1 because we have assumed that nu satisfies a1 so we can uh, uh, we can write nu as this uh, where g is a non trivial uh, measurable function hence it has to be uh, bounded below by a positive constant on a non trivial subset of the circle so uh, we can get a lower bound for this in terms of uh, in terms of the l2 norm of uh, the same trigonometric polynomial but now with respect to the lebesgue measure and on the smaller subset uh, i so uh, we can compare now uh, the l2 norm of uh, this polynomial on the entire interval uh, minus pi pi uh, with the help of turan's lemma and uh, like was uh, remarked uh, there is a non trivial constant here uh, which is what uh, appears uh, here but uh, uh, i'm not going to be very precise here uh, so we get some non trivial constant here uh, uh, so this quantity here is now just the euclidean norm square of v so we find that uh, we get a lower bound for uh, this quantity independent of v and hence we also get a lower bound of uh, lower bound for the smallest eigen value lambda so this is how we get uh, the small wall estimates in this case all right so uh, now that we have uh, uh, both the uh, small wall estimates and uh, tail bounds for uh, the higher derivatives of uh, x we just now have to put together uh, both these uh, estimates and then choose uh, an optimal uh, then make an optimal choice of m so that uh, this uh, sum is as small as possible uh, i'm just going to skip this for now in interest of time and come back later uh, if there is still time okay so this completes uh, part 2 of the talk and uh, we now come to the final part of the talk i want to show you uh, here how to get overcrowding estimates for uh, the nodal volume in higher dimensions using the uh, overcrowding estimates we obtained in the previous part of the talk and uh, so i'm going to restrict myself to dimension 2 uh, uh, what we can do in dimension 2 is uh, representative of uh, what can be done in higher dimensions so there is uh, no loss of generality here all right so uh, before we can talk about um, uh, the uh, overcrowding estimates for nodal length we first want to understand how to measure uh, the nodal length of a random function so a traditional way of measuring the uh, length of a curve is to get a parameterization of this curve and then evaluate uh, the integral of uh, these uh, um Uh, norm of these uh, tangent vectors along the curve but uh, obviously uh, this is not going to be helpful uh, when we want to talk about nodal length of random functions because the nodal set is going to be a random closed set and uh, we can't hope to do any of this for a random set but uh, what uh, what comes to be useful is uh, this integral geometric formula called uh, the crofton's formula so what this uh, vaguely says is that if you have a curve in r2 and uh, if you know the number of intersections of this curve with every single line in r2 then uh, you know what the length of the curve is 
and it is given by uh, uh, this formula. So uh, let me just say uh, what all this is. So first we pick a V, a direction V in S1. And you consider all these uh, parallel lines, uh, lines which are parallel to V. And uh, we can parameterize these lines in terms of uh, the uh, perpendicular to this vector, uh, in terms of V perp, uh, by considering the intersection of these lines with V perp. And uh, that is what I call uh, Y here. So uh, this line I will call, uh, I, I'll denote it by LVY. So uh, we, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so uh, we consider uh, the number of intersections of uh, gamma with L, V, Y as uh, Y varies over this, uh, uh, as Y varies over V perp. And then we look at this integral and then we integrate it once more uh, over all directions. So then you get uh, the length of gamma up to a constant. Okay, so why is this any better than uh, the traditional way of measuring length? Uh, this is so because uh, we do understand to a great extent uh, how to mesh, uh, how to count uh, uh, zeros, uh, random zeros on lines, uh, how to count the zeros of a random function on a line. So we hope uh, that this will be useful for us. But the only problem is there are infinitely many lines. So we need to discretize this uh, Crofton's formula for it uh, uh, for it to be uh, effectively used to study overcrowding uh, of nodal length, which is what we will do in the next two slides. Uh, okay. So just to interrupt, let me put yes, it's seventeen. So can you wrap up quickly? Sorry, uh, it's time almost. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, sure. Um, so. Yeah, so uh, there are two steps of uh, discretization. So in the first step, we discretize this uh, directions. So instead of looking at uh, uh, all directions, we just uh, reduce. We just use uh, whole area formula to uh, reduce it to considering just uh, two directions, and uh, we it is enough to consider two perpendicular directions. Uh, so we take uh, these two directions to be the standard directions E1 and E2. So you get an upper bound for uh, the length of gamma here. Uh, so even then uh, it does not, uh, it is, I mean, even though this is a huge reduction, it is still not enough because uh, there are still infinitely many um, horizontal and vertical uh, lines uh, on which you need to know the zero count. So we need to discretize this once more and uh, that is what I was thinking of telling you here, but uh, maybe I'll just summarize uh, what is present in the slide. So um, uh, we just give uh, uh, conditions to be checked on some finitely many lines here, uh, which is what uh, I've mentioned here, and uh, two conditions on the uh, higher derivatives of F, which can be very easily dealt with using uh, Borel TIS and uh, 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 the Dudley bounds. So uh, uh, with these uh, with these three conditions, now we can conclude that every single horizontal line uh, in this box has no more than n zeros. All right. Uh, yes. So this was what I wanted to say. So in summary, uh, we also get uh, overcrowding estimates for the nodal length. Uh, so if we assume that uh, mu has uh, finite moments and uh, the uh, marginal of mu on uh, these two directions, E1 and E2 satisfy this condition A1. Uh, we need this because we are using uh, uh, the uh, uh, small ball estimates for uh, X restricted to uh, a horizontal or a vertical line. Uh, so under these two assumptions, which are again, not very restrictive, we get overcrowding estimates for uh, the nodal length in terms of the uh, moments. And uh, 
similar to one dimensional case, uh, we can get overcrowding estimates in uh, this case too. And uh, just an example of it is uh, if we take mu to be compactly supported and uh, satisfying uh, this condition, we get uh, exponentially small uh, tails for uh, the nodal length. Uh, so yeah, so I've come to the end of the talk. Um, so there are several interesting uh, but unanswered questions uh, uh, about uh, nodal volume of uh, stationary Gaussian processes. I'll just mention two of them, uh, so uh, which are pert pertinent to our results. So uh, we showed that uh, the nodal volume has uh, very light tails under very uh, uh, mild assumptions on the spectral measure. So we want to ask if uh, we can prove uh, an exponential concentration for nodal volume in higher dimensions, uh, which is not known uh, till now. And uh, the next question is about uh, dimension one. Uh, so the exponential concentration and CLT were uh, uh, proved use, uh, assuming uh, quite strong as, uh, conditions on uh, the covariance K. Uh, so we want to ask if uh, they can be uh, uh, done away with and uh, if we can uh, prove these two results uh, under much milder assumptions on uh, mu or uh, k. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention and uh, I end my talk here. So, uh, are there any questions? Uh... Yeah, I had one. I mean, I think you mentioned it, but I kind of missed it. So when you are doing this small ball estimate, uh, when you applied Turan's lemma, there was an ex mm -hmm. there's like an exponential term there, right? But, uh, yes, right. So that is what is, oh, sorry. Um, yes. So yes, there is a non-trivial term here. There is an exponential term here, which is what appears here. Ah, I see, I see. Okay, okay. Yes, uh, that's a good point. But uh, uh, I just wanted to give you the proof idea. Yeah. So this is not the complete proof. Okay, okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah I... thank you. Yeah. Uh, one other question about this theorem two. You assume that uh, mu e one and e two uh, have this a one condition. Right. So is it generally any two perpendicular directions? Or yes, is that it... is right. So uh, okay. any two perpendicular directions are fine. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't want to uh, um, uh, present the full version of the result because it's a bit unwieldy. So I just simplified it as much as I can. Yeah, yeah. but you are right. Uh, uh, these can be any two perpendicular directions. Any other questions, uh, comments? Oh, it was uh, very nice. Thanks, uh, Priya. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, very nice talk. Thank you. Okay, so we will uh, end here then, and we will resume maybe at uh, three thirty-three uh, in ten minutes. Uh, Should, shouldn't we clap for her? Yes. Yeah. <laughs>